Hello, welcome to this seminar on uh, Stalin and Africa. So I want to welcome you all. I am speaking today from Wurundjeri country down in Melbourne, Victoria in Australia. And this is a topic that I'm really interested in. It's an expansion out from some work that I've done in the past on nationalist movements and ideologies in the Pacific region. This is looking um, at a different hemisphere, looking at different people, but the ideas and um, the contexts are very similar. And so by the end of the paper, I'm going to start making some connections between what was going on in Africa in the 1920s and 30s and what was happening in the Pacific. Um, and I'll do a follow-up um, seminar or masterclass where we can explore that a little bit more. But right now I want to share my screen with you so that you can see the PowerPoint. Uh, hopefully this will work. My computer is a little bit slow today. Okay. Okay, yes. Okay. So that should hopefully work. Okay, so uh, here is the presentation. I will just go into the slideshow. And play from start. Okay, so Stalin and Africa. When I started doing this, the work on this presentation, I thought it was going to go in one direction and then it went in another, which is so often the case. But <laughs> um, usually when you're working on conference papers. Um, so I know that Stalin, Stalin's Russia or Stalin's Soviet Union is a very popular topic for people to look up. Uh, and then I wanted to connect that very popular topic with something that I was more familiar with. That's why um, I've gone with this. So welcome to the Create Your Past presentation on this topic. Um, okay. So yeah, I wanted to acknowledge first and foremost the traditional owners of this land. As I said, I'm talking from Wurundjeri country, which has never been ceded. And um, I wanna acknowledge all the First Nations people who are listening to this presentation today. Okay, so I want to start with Stalin because that is, as I said, the more popular topic um, on Google, Google searches. So Stalin's Soviet Union was one that was turned further in on itself as citizens started to suffer from famine and Stalin became more and more paranoid and destructive, eliminating anyone who he deemed to be a rival. Despite this insularity, as it went on through the 1920s and 30s, the Soviet Union was a source of support and inspiration for many black men and women through these decades who travelled to the Soviet Union as part of arts projects and to study. So in my work, I've really found it inspirational to look at people um, who led activist movements, who seized the opportunity to learn and then to apply their knowledge to bring about social change. So I can see how people were being inspired by the social revolutions going on in the Soviet Union, even though they were at times quite disastrous, um, and then taking it back to their um, colonised places and thinking of ways to forge ahead as a nationalist movement. Moscow and the Soviet Union more bro broadly were described as the Red Mecca. Waylon Rudd was one of the people who took up the opportunity to go to Moscow and was a significant player in the art scene, both painting and creating stage plays. The flow of ideas that moved from Soviet Russia back to Africa was significant and far reaching. And there has been some work done on this. So I've enjoyed reading the work of others who have looked into this a little bit already. Um, there were a series of films that were produced in the Soviet Union that were exported and presented. Um, they presented communism as a cure for the colonial ailments that they saw through 
the world. And it was a potent concept for those struggling with oppression and marginalization. So communism as a concept and as a practice was increasingly popular with African nationalists as the 20th century moved on. One of the texts that resonated with African Marxists was Lenin's book, which was called Imperialism, The Highest Stage of Capitalism, which was published in 1917. And it's pretty obvious from the title why that would have um, had weight. Stalin's Soviet Union initially used this as a launching point to export communism to the colonized world, although this was done warily. Um, as Stalin was loath to trigger nationalist movements in parts of the USSR where they were seeking sovereignty, but he didn't want to see that. Uh, he promoted two key concepts. Matt Swagler is one of the people who's looked into this a little bit. He's, he noted that they were revolution by stages and the block of four classes. Swagler wrote, these theories argued that since the creation of an indigenous bourgeoisie, had been stifled by colonial rule. Nations coming out of colonialism first needed to pass through a bourgeois democratic or national democratic stage of development. This required communists to forge a strategic bloc that brought together intellectuals, peasants, workers, and the emerging nationalist bourgeoisie. In this framework, class differences in the colonized world were secondary to cross-class alliances against imperialism. Uh, so that's that. But Stalin was unimpressed with African communists as he was unconvinced that they were really intending to overthrow the world colonial system um, because they tended to liaise in an amicable way with the metropole. So um, Oya Ogun Bajero, oh, I'm sure I pronounced that name wrong. Sorry. Um, he wrote that Stalin viewed Africa through the lens of orthodox Marxism with an emphasis on class rather than racial struggle. Um, and to be sure, Stalin believed that imperialism could only be overthrown through a proletarian revolution. So he was really thinking in classist terms, whereas race was playing a much bigger factor than he probably recognized or had grappled with. Okay, and I think I have, there are a few slides here that I should have been going through. Now I want to talk about um, Yoma Kenyatta as one of the nationalists who took up some of these concepts or engaged with some of these concepts coming from the Red Mecca. Um, yeah, so they were forging a durable cultural link between the Red Mecca and the larger world of the African diaspora. Uh, and I mentioned Waylon Rudd before. You've got other people like Langston Hughes going to Moscow and traveling throughout the Caucasus. Um, Paul Robeson was also there. Um, and then I've got a little bit more information there about Stalin's socialism, for example, um, and his interest in Libya after World War II. But now let's talk about Kenyatta. Uh, so he was really, I mean, he's one of the more familiar nationalist leaders that came out of Africa and stepped into that independent space as decolonization swept through the continent. Um, he was connected in with communists, but not fully embedded in that movement. He had sought to keep company with communists when he visited Britain in 1929, as they were the most critical, probably um, on a scale of, um, of colonialism and the capitalism that had been brought with it. They sought total social revolution rather than just reforms, which was all really appealing and they were less paternalistic than other people that he had met in Britain. Um, in October, 1929, he had just returned from his first trip to the USSR and he was interviewed for a publication called The Sunday Worker, in which he was quoted, once again, the natives of the colony are showing their determination not to submit to the outrageous tyranny, which has been their lot since the British robbers stole their land. There is agitation that meets a hearty response from robbed and maltreated Africans and will not cease until we are our own rulers again. So he was using um, communist platforms to speak his mes message um, his anti-colonial message, which was interesting, and it was all at that time where he was engaging and traveling through the USSR. He ended up 
attending the JV Stalin Communist University of the Toilers of the East. This university had been established in 1921 and started in taking enrolments from Africa in 1923. Um, the African students were the minority. There were others from China, India, Indonesia, Korea, other parts of Asia. Kenyatta was escorted from Britain by um, a West Indian man named George Padmore. They became firm friends and were working together pretty closely over the following years. Um, the Soviet Union had, quote, posited a form of modernity that resonated with Padmore because of the, and I quote again, perceived parallel routes of subordination to the West where both Africa, African Americans and Russians Experience, experienced a doubleness. That is, both were perceived to be both within and outside the West. So there's this kind of tandem of identity being held together by people. Kenyatta reconnected with Padmore in 1931 when he returned to London. And then they went again to Moscow together in 1932. Um, that's when he started at university. Many at that time have misinterpreted or misconstrued Kenyatta's alliances and affiliations with the USSR. The British Colonialist Administration put forward official paranoid fantasies about him attending what they called the Lenin School of Subversion. But Kenyatta's own accounts show that he was pretty unhappy <laughs> with his experience at the university. There was a lot of discontent. The facilities, his teachers were lackluster in his opinion. He was not recruited to the common term um, at the end of his studies, partly because he had openly critiqued Marxism. And then the other factor was that he was a very known entity to British police. So he was just too obvious. Um, and so at this time when he left that university in the USSR and returned to Britain, the USSR was increasingly turning in on itself, as I said at the start of this talk, turning inward. Um, and then the Nazis were coming to power, so there were a lot of power shifts going on in Europe. Um, the Soviets started to reduce their engagement with other territories like um, the places where they were trying to generate anti-colonial movements beforehand. Um, but Kenyatta still was connecting with communists in London. So when he was there in August 1933, he was engaging with people writing for Marxist journals. He wrote in one um, publication called The Negro Worker, and he wrote a piece called Kenya. And in this, he analysed Kenya's predicament through the Marxist lens and described the processes of capitalist um, imperialism. He wrote about the processes of detribalization and shifts to modernity. And this is where I can see there's so many similarities between Africa and the Pacific and the ideas that he's grappling with and the ideas that other leaders that I've looked at were trying to face. So I've been working on this biography about a man named Isoli Salem from New Island province in Papua New Guinea, and he's looking into this as well. It's very much something that people were talking about in the Methodist mission in Fiji too through these decades. Um, so the Marxists saw Kikuyu um, cultural views, values as reflections of feudal and tribal society though. So this is where it starts to fall apart. They believe the features needed to change in order to ensure a cohesive revolutionary state for the society to shift towards socialism they, want, they felt like the Kikuyu needed to shed a lot of those cultural values and that was not what Kenyatta was looking for. Um, Kenyatta's writing showed the Eurocentrism of communism and the limitations that that ideology had for Kenya. Um, and so he stopped writing for the Marxists in around 1935. That was really the, the point where he um, could evidently be seen to be getting more disillusioned. And then he shifts his gaze increasingly to anthropology, and that's where I'll pick up next time. Um, and again, this is where I can talk a lot more about anthropology and how it was influencing nationalist movements in the Pacific too, because so many people 
working in missions and government were getting trained in anthropology before going out into the Australian and British colonies. And this is where Kenyatta was getting his training. He was getting trained in London and then taking those ideas from the discipline back to his home and thinking through the way culture would have to adapt or not to the colonial society it was um, getting challenged by. All right, so that's it for this session. Um, I hope that that's been interesting for you all and I hope to catch you next time um, on what I guess I could call history chat. Take care.